one you uh, increased or changed bird migration behavior. Um, <clears throat> Reese, I think to attribute global warming to changes in bird migration just straight off the bat would be probably premature. Is it likely to? Not so much the temperature, but because it will almost certainly influence the distribution of rain and therefore the distribution of seeds for seed-eating birds or insects for the insect-eating birds, it will almost certainly affect the distribution of where birds migrate. Will it affect the times at which they migrate? I don't think hugely because the seasons will remain the same. So it probably won't so much affect the times as the distributions of where those birds will go. And I can't think of anything in particular that I know of that has been sort of irrevocably changed by global warming, but I imagine there are some species that have absolutely had their sort of migratory patterns uh, changed almost irrevocably by global warming. In South Africa, we think that climate change and global warming will result in a much wetter part of the world here. The central parts of the country and off to the west will become even drier than they are now and so this will become hotter and wetter and so it's quite likely that over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years that this area will experience an inundation of birds that we don't necessarily normally associate with an area as dry as this because this area could well become a bit wetter and so that will bring in different birds as it does in very wet years we've seen the white-winged widows here we've seen the red collared widow here and in wet years that's not unusual but i suspect that might become more and more of the norm but who knows who knows nice question that mainly because it leaves a lot to discuss let's see if we can't get toward three in a row pan Craig, you're in the United Kingdom and wondering if we get parrots and there and if we do uh, would I find you one? Well Craig I'm going to say no we don't so that I can relieve myself of the pressure of trying to find you one. That of course would be an unspeakable lie. We do yes absolutely get parrots here. We get the brown headed parrot whose picture I will show you and of course the first thing you will notice about the brown headed parrot is the fact that the most obvious feature is in fact it's Martin, what do you think the most obvious feature of the brown-headed parrot is? Invisible to see? In, no, no, that wouldn't be obvious. That would be the opposite of obvious. A brown-headed parrot has a very obvious... A br uh, no? Not coming? Yeah. No inspiration coming to you? No, incorrect. Not a brown head, but in fact it's green back. There it is. So that is the brown-headed parrot. And then the other parrots we get here, this thing is called a rose-ringed parakeet. And inter interestingly, I've actually just seen it for the very first time in the wild. It is an Indian species. And so you find it at Kaziringa or in Bandavgar, where we were. And then down here, you've got the mayor's parrot, which is a gorgeous parrot, which you find in Botswana and Zimbabwe largely. And then, of course, the Rupal's parrot, possibly our most beautiful parrot uh, with its red eye yellow shoulders, blue bottom, found in Namibia. And then the Cape Parrot, which I feel is, well, uh, maybe this, this one over here. This is a slightly uh, ugly brother, should we say? It's not ugly, but it's not quite as um, obviously beautiful as the others. Right, from the Cape Parrot, let's just go across to Brent Deer Smith, who is nowhere near the Cape, and indeed it is not his favourite place. Yes, not near the Cape at all, uh, but of some good news, and you might hear some swishing behind me. That's Vim beating pepper ticks off his legs. He just jumped down from the car while I was wandering around, and I managed to walk through the bush for about half a kilometer and not get a single pepper tick. Vim walked two meters and became full of pepper ticks. Uh, but good news, I found really fresh tracks of Shadow and her cub. Now. They were in an area where we've got no, no vehicle signal, but they were heading north. So, fingers crossed, she's going to pop out somewhere around Parallel and uh, the Sibambili cut line. So, we're going to keep 
keep going very slowly. Now she could have popped out and headed straight west from where she was. So we probably we par parked down there and we parked about over there and I walked probably to about there in, in the riverbed and there are literally tracks everywhere that cub has run and played and been playing with her mom had a drink or his mom I don't know if it's a male or female yet I actually haven't seen this cub Vim do you know? I don't know. No. Does anyone know whether Shadow's remaining cub is a male or a female? I'd love to know uh, but so I'm confident they're here. Now the one thing I might be a little bit worried about is that I might have very easily walked past the cub, especially if Shadow's left the cub. Uh, it would have just gone into the little hiding mode and just crawled up into a little ball. So we're just going to keep going very slowly. It is getting to that time of the day when even if Shadow uh, has left the cub we might find her patrolling, hunting, Remember, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter if you've got any questions for us. Uh, VM and I are currently looking for a female leopard and a tiny little cub. And we've had the footprints probably about 100 meters from me here, but heading uh, directly sort of northeast. Well, actually more due north than northeast. So she could easily duck up to the west here. So that's why we're going very slowly along this road, making sure there are no tracks that evade us. And hopefully, if luck is on our side, Shadow will just step into the brilliant golden afternoon light with her cub just behind her. Well, leopards are not the only things that look magnificent in the afternoon light, so let's go see what f is flooded into Jamie's golden light. Oh dear, oh dear. I'm sorry about that. I, I, I suppose I could flap in the golden light for a while. But the butterfly, the butterfly is gone. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. The butterfly has decided to fly away. As happens, it was a really beautiful acria, if that makes any kind of a difference to our day. We'll be happy to know that I've recovered from my allergy attack and found a tissue in the form of some wound packing gauze from the first aid kit. So, needs will as needs must. Now we're trying to creep up on this elephant once again. He's just been so obliging. But to give you an idea of the size of the footprint of this animal, and I mean, he's not that, not a massive old gentleman, but he's quite a big boy there, I can see him. He's not too far away. But just to give you an idea of the size, here's his track over here. And you can actually see where he's kind of dragged his toe a little bit as he's walked along. So he's still quite close to us actually. I actually thought he'd moved a bit further away. But he's just, just <clears throat> on the other side of these impala. Now what we don't want to do in this situation is scare the impala and scare him as a result. So that's something that we want to avoid doing and it's something you've got to be aware of. Not just the reaction of the animal that you're following, but the reaction of the animals around you. And sometimes you can spook one set of animals, particularly something as easily sort of scared as an impala, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a tricky situation because you've then scared something slightly larger. I think what we'll do... Yeah. I think what we'll do we'll just go a little bit around like this. He's slowly making his way towards quarantine which is the big open area outside of our camps and that's what I'm aiming for is to get a really really nice view of him with the sunset. That's what I'm aiming for. That's what I think would be wonderful. Now I'm crouching down the Impala are going to think that I'm stalking them which I also don't want to give them that idea but let's go around here. Let's try and move slowly but surely into a slightly better position. So far he's been phenomenally tolerant of us. 
Hopefully he continues to be so. So while we, while we sneak up on our elephant ball, let's go across and see whether James has had any luck on cheetah planes. Well, it depends entirely on your definition of luck, I suppose. Uh, have I found anything? No. But I have found the smell of grass turning cooler as the sun begins to set. And of course that is a wonderful scent. And one of the main reasons I live out here, especially at this time of the year as we go towards the autumn, the evenings tend to cool a little bit faster than they do, of course, at the height of summer. And that brings out a whole suite of delicious smells. And it gives one peace in a hectic world. And while I know that we don't talk about politics, of course, on Safari Live, uh, as all of us know, various political machinations in our countries drive us alternatively deliriously happy and deliriously mad with anger. We've had a bit of the latter in our country of the last week, and so to be out in the wilderness again, smelling the loveliness of an unchanging natural world, that, well, of course it changes, but it is consistent in its appeal to me and its kindness to all of us. And, of course, while the politicians do it for themselves, as the old song goes, if I might paraphrase it, well, the wilderness does it for us. And that's what I'm enjoying just driving through Cheetah Plains for right now. We're about to arrive at Cheetah Plains Pan, where if current sort of luck has to always to hold, there'll be absolutely nothing but the plains stretching out towards the east from there. Of course the grass still so long that you have only to be, well, uh, anything smaller than an impala and you'll disappear within three feet of the road. Right, here we are. Anything there? Anything there? Will we be lucky? Uh, 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 no. 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 A natural, you agree with me, you say that's why we're all here. Yes, you see, I think that's exactly correct. Isn't the wilderness a wonderful escape from the circus we as human beings have created for ourselves to live in? There are some birds. We'll have a look and see what they are. Do you see the birds, Martin? Unfortunately, you will need a scanning electron microscope to see them at that focal distance. Yes, there we are. We've got some doves. Very nice. Laughing doves. And then what looks to be some Egyptian geese, I think. Is that what they are? It is indeed. Some Egyptian gooses. Uh, to the left-hand side of them we have some crowned lapwings. And as I said, you can just feel the peace has descended entirely as the light turns from its, well, washed out yellow, I suppose, to much more burnished copper. Of course, gold would have been a much better word to use there, but I've used it too often. Now, Mohammed, you're wondering about migratory birds as well. We were talking about them a little earlier with regard to climate change. You want to know if any of them lay their eggs out here? Yes, most of them, actually. Most of the birds that migrate here are what we call summer residents, which means they breed here. So I think all of the cuckoos, bar the European cuckoo, which obviously breeds in Europe, breeds here. Uh, the European roller doesn't breed here. Um, what else? We've got all of the eagles, except, well, no, not all the eagles. The steppe eagle doesn't breed here when it comes out, nor does the lesser spotted. Um, all of the bee eaters, do the bee eaters, no they don't all, the European bee eater doesn't breed here, the barn swallows don't, be, uh, don't uh, breed here, they breed over in Europe in the Palearctic. I'm going to say about 60% of the birds that migrate here breed here and then not again when they go back to the Palearctic. Of course many of the birds that we get here are intra-African migrants, which means they go north of us and it's probably 50-50 of the intra-African migrants breed here. 
and breed in North Africa and then I'd say probably 60-40 of the rest would breed here. So 60% down. Because it's a more tropical area I think you'll find that most of them when they go to the north uh, it's just easier probably to breed in a tropical area than it is in a more temperate zone where things are much more temporary. That's not why it's called a temperate zone but they are a bit more temporary. Good. Let us go... Let's go left. Well, consulting detective, what a nice question you have, and especially as it's, well, there's a little bit of a trick in it, even though you didn't realize, I don't think. You said you've only ever seen Egyptian geese here. Are there any other kinds? I'm assuming you mean, any, sorry, I can't get around the corner. Any other kinds of geese? Uh, consulting detective, there is uh, only one kind of goose, true goose, that we get in Africa, and that's not it. It's actually a duck, the Egyptian goose. I'm not sure why it's called a goose, but it is. The only true goose we get here is something called a spur-winged goose, and yes, we do get them here from time to time. The last one I saw, however, uh, it flew. It was a fascinating sighting. It came flying in. Fr I was sitting at Biffleshook Dam, where I haven't found anything for the last, I don't know, five or six months. It flew up over Biffleshook Dam, did one loop. This is before it filled up, and it was a fairly unsightly mess. It did one loop, decided to hell with this, and disappeared east off into the Kruger. So, yes, we do get the only goose that we get out here, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, is the Spurwing Goose. We do find it from time to time but not very often. They prefer slightly more permanent water, I think. I've just had a statement from Rebecca. What it's, where it comes from, I'm not sure, but she said, apparently some baboons raided an Egyptian goose nest in the Kruger recently. Thank you very much for that, Rebecca. Wonderful. Wonderful to know. Good stuff. <laughs> Right, Jamie Patterson apparently is still knocking about the Juma Dam. She's still with those elephants and she'd like to tell you a bit more about them. Judging by Rebecca's tone when she was trying to link across to me, it sounds as though James is back on the job of entertaining everybody and keeping everybody thoroughly amused. So we've actually had a beautiful view of this male elephant. He hasn't made it out into the open yet. And fair enough, he's in no rush, and we are entirely on his schedule. Just patiently waiting. No, don't come this way, boy. Hey, go that way, go west. That would be ideal. And you can see he's almost completely dry after his swim. A little bit of wet around his eyes, but that's about it. We've got this slow and leisurely approach to things. Our James mentioned that we were still with our elephants. We should probably clarify that we were only with one. Although, Rexon did try to make us both jump by saying the other one was behind us and not to run. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, went, there's the other one! Don't run! <laughs> but the other one's actually split away. The other one has split away from the rest of the group. Oh, let's go... I think, rather than going round in front of him, oh, <laughs> Impala are scaring each other, let's rather go a little bit further to the back. And not often I say this whilst walking, but while we reposition, let's go and find out what Brent is up to. Well, we're still in search for Shadow and Shadow's cub. There's some very upset cesticulars in this marula tree. They're quite high up. You can just hear them. Where have they gone now? Ah, there we go. And you see it hopping around in the dark there. That's a southern black tit, I think. 
Let's try to see, there might have been a snake in the tree. And it doesn't look like it. There we go, what did you find, Vam? Oh, there we go. Vam's got a, ooh, a southern black tit that's feeding. Probably looking for spiders and caterpillars. So not the one who's making all the noise. Probably no snake, probably just a paranoid sister killer. Means the southern black tit seems to be very relaxed with life. Now, hello Shmama. Shmama, I know you've been chatting about migratory birds. I was wondering, do certain bird species follow rainfall? Well, pretty much all the migrants, that is what they follow. So once you have rainfall, you get explosions of insects uh, or explosions of grass, depending on what you eat. And so your big, your migratory eagles, the main reason they actually come to Southern Africa is after the rains, uh, specifically for the termite alates, the, uh, the termite, uh, the termite explosions, uh, and as well as grasshoppers and other bugs and high-protein insects. Uh, also, when the grass explodes, all the grass seeds explode, which also causes an explosion in a small a little uh, rodents like uh, bush vulture gerbils, tiny fat mice, and the like, which is obviously also very good food for them. Now, I am convinced that shadow is in here. It is. One of the most difficult parts of Abarathusa, this top headwater of the Marrakeen. And I was hoping that she might have moved out as it's got a bit cooler. It is time to go hunting. It could definitely be worth, definitely worth, if we have no luck here today, getting stuck into that drainage line on foot tomorrow. Now, I had a cedar point. Cedar point's wondering, does the hot weather make the big cats more, or, oh sorry, less active? Uh, indeed it does. So, when it's hot, the big cats have problem getting rid of heat, so they rest longer. Although, now that we're ending our, our sort of height of summer, we're right at the end of summer now, the temperature drops at, in the evening far quicker. Ooh, quickly across to James, who's got a bird of prey. Well, it's not flying away, so we don't have to be too quick about it, but what do you think it is? A great mystery, great mystery. Ah, it's a chicken. It isn't a chicken, I'm joking. Worth recording? Um, I, no, I wouldn't say this was worth recording necessarily here, Martin. Uh, it's not doing an astounding array of different things. That, everyone looks like a Wahlberg's eagle to me, but it is not pushing out its little crest. Is that as close in as you can get there? And can you just brighten it slightly? Let's just see if we can't... I mean, the only other thing it could be is a step eagle. It's not lesser spotted, because the leg... No, it's definitely Wahlberg's. It's a Wahlberg's eagle. Oh, is it? So it's not a lesser spotted eagle because its its legs are feathered thickly all the way to the base. They're not stove piped or um, skinny jeans, as would probably be much more appropriate these days. Martin, you're from Cape Town. Do you wear skinny jeans? Oh, good. That's a relief. Eggsy, of course, is a fan of the skinny jean pant. Uh, that's got nothing to do with his bird. And then, if it was a step, uh, a tawny eagle. Well, then it would have a much darker back and lighter front. But a Wahlberg's has normally got that little crest sticking up from the back. So maybe it's just a smallish step eagle. Maybe I'm misguessing that size. No, it can't be a step eagle. No, it's too small. Does its gape extend beyond the back of its eye? I think it does. So the gape, of course, are its, basically its yellow lips, if you like. And do they extend more than halfway behind its eye? 
That would make it a step eagle immediately. Yeah, I think it does. I'm going to go with step eagle, everyone. I'm more than happy to take criticism on that because it looks too small to me, but I don't think it's a Wahlberg's. And if it is a step eagle, it'll be just about to go home. Step eagle, of course, a fearsomely large eagle, uh, but is not, in fact, a very terrifying eagle in that it is an eater largely of termites, which I've always found quite interesting. Anybody else have anything to say about whether or not that could or couldn't be a steppe eagle or a Wahlberg's eagle? Let me go know. Hashtag Safari Live. Now, some of you said a tawny eagle. I really don't think it is. I'm, I'm prepared to go around it and have a look. If you look at a tawny eagle from the back, its wings on its shoulders here are normally darker than the front, quite a lot darker. And unless that is a very dark form tawny, I just don't think it is. Also, if you look at its back, there'll be a distinctive V. So let's, I mean, there's a little road here. We'll do a little turn around there and see if we can't have a look at it from the back. A couple of impala and wildebeest around this area. None of them looking like they're about to be savaged by predators. There, let's have a look at it again now. I mean, I must say its wings now do look darker behind than they are in front. Oh gosh, I mean, this is a bit embarrassing. I would have thought by now the brown eagles were completely obviously easy to me. <coughs> hmm. Yeah, it could be a dark form tawny. Dark form, a tawny is just over two feet tall. A step eagle, well, another three inches taller than that. Hmm. Gosh, I don't know. I think I'm going to go with step eagle, chaps. No, Bobby, it's definitely not a kite, and we know that because it doesn't, it's got feathers all the way down to the bottom of its feet. So its legs are covered in feathers, which immediately makes it an eagle. I'm going to go with step eagle. And then we're going to move on before we get any closer and before I can contradict myself again. Now, James, you're wondering why the tips of many raptors' beaks are black or dark in colour. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure why. I think it probably, I mean, that's the natural colour of the keratin. So I think it'd probably be a better question to ask why it is that any of them are yellow. What, what, what's the advantage to them being yellow? Because the yellow would be an expensive pigment to... You know, they have to colour it, so it would be an exp expensive pigment to produce. And why would they produce it that colour? And maybe it's got something to do with um, attracting mates, but you see then, of course, as the problem goes with our roller, we don't know why they're all that colour, male and female. There is a wildebeest lurking in the grass. Hmm. It really is gorgeous out here today. It is so golden, as Rebecca says. That thankfully is something useful, she's told me, unlike her last effort. I mean, that really is very pretty, isn't it? Rebecca, would you like to try again? Would you like to give me another fact? No. Rebecca's next fact, everybody, is that wildebeests are cool. Hmm. I think we should get Rebecca to present one day. I think that'd be wonderfully fun. <laughs> what do you think, Rebecca? Do you think you should present one day? Gorgeous. 
All righty, let's carry on into the clearings. We're not far from the clearings now. Ooh, hang on. There's, I mean, we've shown this to you before, but if you are keeping a bird list and you don't watch every single show, that's quite interesting. There's a less, lesser grey shrike sitting on that stump over there. There you go. Beautiful. That is uh, the lesser grey shrike. Why it is lesser than the greater one? Well, who knows? I don't. You can just see them catching some rays there, enjoying the sights of the sun going down. He's going to come back to the same perch. No, he's not. He's going to fly past it and to another perch. Let's continue. All right there. On we go. Now I believe Brent Leo Smith is manfully still soldiering away on Arethusa. What he's managed to find I don't know, but I'm sure he'll tell you now. Well, we're still looking for that female leopard. Uh, no sign of her just yet. So we're hoping that she's going to pop out of the drainage line shortly. So the last tracks I said were just in here. And this is one of her favorite areas. Now we've got decisions to make. Do we do one more loop? Why don't you guys let me know? Should we do one more loop to try to find Shadow and Cub? Or should we abandon and go check Gauri Main for little Shongile? Uh, you let me know. What do you want us to do? Use the hashtag. Tag Safari Live on Twitter. You let me know, Shongile or Shadow and Cub. Now, those tracks we found in here were definitely from today, during the day. The cub had been running up and down and playing, and uh, we even found where it had a drink at a little mud wallow. Now, the area we've been circling is probably about. hundred hectares, 75 hectares. Uh, so just over 200 acres. And uh, we're pretty sure she's in there somewhere. And, oh, there we go. Now, there's some of uh, the animals that might help us find the leopards. The crested Franklin. And they give a very stern alarm call, especially when there's a leopard cub around, because they like to stalk and try to catch little crested Franklins. And you can see the adults on the right. And uh, she's done quite well. She's got, what, four, five? A little one she's managed to successfully raise there. Look at that. Proud mom keeping a lookout, making sure uh, there's no dangerous creatures about. Okay. So I'll show you the spot where Shadow and her cub had a drink a bit earlier today. Here we go. So the cub drank at that mud wallow there. So the little leopard tracks were... Couldn't we see them from here? They're a bit too far. Oh, it's a bit too far, but there are little cub tracks along that mud there, and she had a drink right there. So, she's here somewhere. Well, if Shadow isn't, the cub is definitely. Now, David's wondering how many grandchildren does Karula have? Well, we're going to have to do this. So, let's start at the beginning, which is Shadow. Oh, no, no, Shadow's a daughter. Oh, dear, grandchildren. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay, I'm going to keep driving while I think about that. Um, well, let's start. Uh, Sindile, definitely. Bahuti, well done, Vim. Kuchava, that's three. Now, of course, we can only count the females. 
uh, cubs because the male cubs, it's without genetic testing, it's impossible. Oh, what was that? Did I hear an upset go away bird? Wait, squirrel? It's a squirrel alarming up ahead. And I mean, we know the leopards are around here, so that's definitely something we want to follow up quite quickly on. But uh, so, Definitely that we know of is Sindile, Kachava and Bahuti. Only three grandkids. Of course, most of... Oh, Tumba. Well done, Fiam. There's another one. Tumba. Okay, just, just hang on a second. I think that squirrel was around here. Indeed. Oh, let's just try pinpoint where the squirrel is. So just in here. Checking very carefully on the ground. Now, of course, it could be alarm calling it a bird of prey, it could be alarm calling it a, a slender mongoose, but with such fresh leopard tracks in the area, it's not something we can ignore. Where have you gone, squirrel? Okay, there's a de big dead... Um, what was it? A, a knob thorn there. That's a, an ideal squirrel hidey hole, and it sounds like the squirrel's on the other side of that. Now we want to try to see where the squirrel's looking at or whether the squirrel is just having an argument with the other squirrels. Now one of the other problems is that a squirrel with that height might have seen something 50, 100 meters away. It's gone quiet now, but this is the time of the day when the cats are going to start moving, the sun's just setting below the horizon. Now, quite a funny story. For those of you who've been on an African safari, at this time of the day, generally, your safari guide will be looking for a nice spot to stop, have a gin and tonic, you know, just enjoy, relax. Now, the original reason that that started was nothing to do for, with giving your guests a break or whatnot. It's a uh, specifically in the Sabi Sands because the sort of the first place to really off-road night drive was the Sabi Sands and in those days it was just on the end of where lions and leopards were hunted uh, in the in this area so they were still quite nervous but this is the time of the day when they start moving so the impala start spotting them start alarm calling or the lions might start calling uh, or the le but they just start moving so there's alarm calls and things happening so what would happen is the safari guide would set up a, a gin and tonic drink stop for his guests his tracker would wander off normally about 50 or 60 meters away and just sit and listen to the bush and that was how they initially really started finding the big cats in this area but I think the squirrel sent us on a wild goose chase. Wild leopard chase. Wild leopard chase, yes. Now that it's it's sort of the moment when you sort of want uh, oh they're sending us on a wild goose chase, and then you just want them to sort of walk in over shoulder without you being able to see them. But we can always wish. Uh, oh, it seems like everyone has voted that we go have a look for Shongile and abandon our search for Shadow and Cub. So we shall do that, but while we make our way to that area, let's go to James, who's trying to eat noodles in the Far East. Oh, 
I would very much hope that something will come out to play now that the sun has gone down because there has not been a great deal of activity over here at all. Anyway, so be it, there it is. We're on our way back towards three in a row pan and then we're going to head back towards Juma for the last part of the drive. Now I'm not sure whether the cats will come out or not but what I will say is that at this time of year of course once the sun does dip below the horizon the temperature change is quite profound in that it gets much cooler I mean and I'm sure most of you who are experiencing what must be spring almost well just yeah you're pretty much in spring now must be most relieved that the winter is now over no, nothing. No. Well done. Okay. <laughs> How are your comms? Are you getting them? Not. Okay, poor old Martin is not getting any communications from Rebecca. But of course, given the standard of the factoids she's delivered to us today, is probably a merciful release. Oh, those birds have flown away. Now we're going back also into the area where supposedly Vitormi was last seen, but you know, in this grass, as I say, not easy. We'll try and get you a last view of the horizon before the sun is completely gone, but I think we might be a little bit low down. Uh, there you are, just very quickly. You see it there at all? where it went everyone it's gone again the western horizon a burnished orange and we'll just be quiet for 20 seconds and listen to the night starting to build Just so very quiet indeed. Far fewer birds calling than just than even a week ago. And also, of course, as I listened to Martin slapping his head, I think far fewer flies than there have been. Yeah, I must say there's a real peace about today. It's precisely the time of the day to be sitting by a water hole with your very nearest and dearest close to you uh, sipping on a fine tipple or whatever that might be for you. Alrighty, on we go. Vroom, vroom. I'd be interested to know, of course, how much time we have in the dark. It still looks like we're going to have about half an hour. What was that, Rebecca? Oh, a bird. I see. Rebecca is just talking to me in my ear about various things that need not concern you. I'm not convinced they need concern me either, but, you know, that's just the way she seems to be today. I'm, of course, going to be in untold amounts of trouble when I get home now. Now, this is where Andrew told me that Elvis said that his physiotherapist's dog's vet's friend's daughter said that she had heard that Tommy could maybe have been around here at some stage. Oh, I believe that Jamie hasn't left us yet. I thought she'd close down. We're going to head back to her so that she might bid you sayonara. 
I haven't left you yet, I promise. We are still here, still alive and well. I'm not sure whether James meant we've just returned because it's getting dark and it is quite dark, or if uh, perhaps we'd been squashed by the elephant. I'm not sure where he was going with that thought. And sorry, let's just have a look at this. Come a little bit this way and watch this wildebeest do his preparations. I'm hoping he's not going to stop now. Watch this wilde. Here we go. Oh, hopefully he's going to continue. So as it starts to get dark now, and I wanted to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But once it starts to get dark, all of the wildebeest are moving out into the open area. And I just wanted to show you, look what he's doing. Can you see him there? Yes. Look, he's scent marking. And at this particular time of year, it is particularly um, important for him to do so. Because, of course, he doesn't have a harem. He wants to keep this harem here. So he's making sure that his territory smells very, very strongly of him. Rubbing up against the tree, he's got pre-orbital glands with very strong scent scents attached to them. It's such a strong scent, actually, that you can smell it as a human being. If I were to walk up to that tree now, and I'm not going to because it's in the opposite direction to the one I want to go in. But if you were to walk up that, to that tree now, you would smell a very goaty smell. Like a mixture between a goat and a horse. That's the kind of smell that that pre-orbital gland leaves behind up against the tree. It's actually quite a nice smell. And he's been scraping his feet and getting all ready for bed. Making sure all the ladies know that this is his area. Hmm. Now, Alexander, you want to know if wildebeest are closely related to horse or to the cow? Closer to the cow, I would assume. And the reason that I say that about the wildebeest is just simply because they're ruminants rather than hind gut fermenters or gut fermenters. So things like zebra are hind gut fermenters and are more closely related to the horse. They're part of the equidae family. There he goes. Look, there he's scraping his feet. The pedal glands in between the two halves of his hooves. And that gives us another distinction between um, cows, horses and antelope. Uh, horses are odd-toed ungulates. So, in other words, they only have one toe. The other odd-toed ungulate that we get out here is a rhinoceros with three toes. But an antelope and a cow are both even-toed ungulates with four toes. The other even-toed ungulate being the hippopotamus with four. Sorry, not... The antelope have two, cows have two, hippo have four. I'm thinking ahead of myself. My brain's moving too fast for me. So there you go. And they're probably more closely related to cows than they are to horses. And even then, they're not particularly closely related to cows. Not even buffalo are all that closely related to domestic cattle. And of all of those animals that I've just mentioned, I guess probably the zebra and the horse would be the closest related. Oh, he's having a great time. Uh, Jackie J, you want to know what is the average size of your adult male wildebeest's territory? Funnily enough, it depends very much upon where the territory is, even more so than some of the animals like leopards or lions, for example. The territories that are the best, close to water, lots of good grass, a good place to have a, a, a territory, they're going to be much, much smaller. And you're probably looking at, if off the top of my head, if I think about this area, he's probably got a territory of around about 100 hectares. 100 football fields, maybe a bit more, but those will get more, those will get smaller and smaller because the competition is fiercer for better territories. Because better territories mean a better chance for the females being around when it comes time for mating season. And then, as you move into the outskirts or places where the resources aren't as good, then you get a situation where the territories are slightly larger. So, there's a great degree of variance with territories of blue wildebeest in this area and of course they're territorial here whereas in certain other parts of Africa they're not particularly territorial so it is very much a circumstantial situation 
And just as it starts to get dark, and it is getting quite dark, our elephant is all the way on the other side of quarantine. There he goes. Now, oh, Debbie, you want to know if the, if the herd were to be attacked, would the male try to protect his harem? It's a good question. Probably not more so than is just a natural protective herd instinct. I've seen wildebeest chase away wild dogs before, gathering together in a group, and I've seen a male included in that group. So I guess that's one example of them attacking back. Uh, but if it's something if it's something like a lion, no, probably not. And even leopard attacks on calves, it's relatively unusual for the male to come and defend in the same way that a male stallion does. So a zebra stallion, they tend to be very aggressive in defending their harem. But remember, it's their harem. Whereas with the blue wildebeest, they have a mating season, the females come into the territory of the male, he might mate with them, he might not, and he doesn't ne he's not necessarily as invested in those offspring as a male zebra is. So he's not as likely to be as defensive. Whereas the females will actually band together and try and protect the young calves. I wanted to show you one more thing, just quickly. Here's the moon. And while we have a look at the glorious moon, Steve Haskell, it is lovely to hear from you. Now, Steve is a new viewer, and Steve would very much like to know how he could go about asking questions and whether or not we'll answer them. We'll do our best to answer them, Steve. Uh, obviously, we get lots and lots of questions, and we don't always get around to them, but... If you ask us a question about what it is we're talking about or something related to what we're seeing, then you are almost guaranteed of an answer. And if you don't get one, just keep trying. And you can do that by hashtagging Safari Live on Twitter. So if you are unfamiliar with Twitter, as I know some people are, and forgive me, I'm not being patronizing, that means that in your tweet, after you've finished asking your question, you put a hashtag and then you write the word Safari Live, or one word. And then we will see it, and then we shall answer it. When the lady's in final control, it goes through quite a process, you know. First of all, it's got to go through the World Wide Web. Then it's got to be fed through into the computer, and then passed from direct to two to direct to one, and then it's got to be fed into my ear. So it's quite the process to get your question across here, but absolutely we will answer it. On that note, it is now actually getting really dark, and really was time for us to be home and inside and safely tucked away indoors about five or ten minutes ago. So it's time for us to say goodbye. Very, very well done, Senzo. Excellent job. And thank you to all of you for joining us. I'm going to give you into the capable hands of Brent and James for the final moments of your sunset safari. Bye-bye, everybody. We're going to head down here quite slowly. Now that big herd of a buffalo we saw earlier, apparently they meandered this way and uh, crossed into Hoffman's here. But, ooh, I see cars that have stopped. What have you seen, vehicles? Let me find out from them on the radio. I think it could be the buffalo, I'm not sure. But it looks like that. No, it is the buffalo. Okay, hello buffs. Or stragglers from the herd. No, the herd hasn't even left Juma yet. They're still meandering around on the Juma side of the road. Oh, why are you guys running? I think they're just having a bit of a silly five minutes as it gets cool. Now, they're going to rest up shortly. So they've had a drink somewhere, but and they will find a nice spot where they're going to rest up for the evening, chew the cud, and hopefully, for their sakes, avoid the lions. You can see a lot more active than they were earlier. I do love it when a buffalo looks down its nose at you. The old adage that looking at you like you owe the money. Let's just go a little bit forward. Yeah. So they should be on the fire break. 
Oh, big termite mound. Oh, I love that smell. Hello, dusty flows. Look at that. Look at all the dust coming off them. Now, to be a buffalo during the dry season in Africa, you spend your life in the dust. And I can just hear all the little sounds. Little grunts, and there we go, there's a big grunt. That rubbing of knocking of horns together. VM incoming. Here comes a big bull. It looks like they might be having a little argument. I heard them running towards us. It looks like all bulls in this little group, all, all big bulls. Maybe there was a female mistress down there. some more coming in here. There's a few females coming in now. <laughs> Tim, I couldn't agree with you more. Their faces are truly priceless. Let me try to get the water. There's some running in quite quickly from down there. Daniel, a man after my own heart. Uh, hopefully with this many buffalo, it means the lions are going to come back tonight. We can only hope, Daniel, we can only hope. So many noises. Burr. drop of the head there reminding one of the younger boys who's the boss might not have the biggest horns but you can see they are properly well developed bosses on him okay so we've spent a lot of time with these buffalo there are quite a few people trying to get here um, before it gets dark so we bumped into them by accident I didn't I didn't realize they were here so we're gonna go around them and uh, continue our search for a little Shongile well there's that big termite mound again let's go a little bit So there are two cars here, so we'll make space for someone else. I just want to ask Andres quickly whether they found Shongile this morning. Sorry? Loot. Not for three weeks. Um, last in Konsol for Shadow and Mampimpana in the Marakene, but maybe 500 meters north of Red Dam, between Parallel and, and the cut line there. But, and they were nice in Konsol. Did anyone find that little Wansati? 
How far inside? Where? Yeah. Kashan. Yeah, uh, she was eating terrapins yesterday. Yeah. Right. Enjoy. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Okay, well, there we go. The update on Shongile is that um, we probably should have stayed looking for Shadow. <laughs> uh, she is about three and a half, four kilometers inside a uh, little Gauri this afternoon at the little Gauri uh, camp. So she is enjoying time there, maybe looking for her mom. Uh, Roy was just asking me if we had seen any sign of Karula, and we haven't either. And Sean. Hello, Uncle Sean. Oh, nice to see you. It was very good. And thanks very much. So Sean is asking how he went to leave. He's just jealous. I, he didn't get to go to the Pixies concert like I did. I did go see the Pixies. Yes, it was. It was very good. Hello, uh, Viam. I just had Shangile down little Gari Kaya. Okay. Yeah, she was eating terrapins yesterday. No idea. I'm going to go try find her now. Good luck. Good luck. Okay, awesome. Mm. And then really nice tracks of shadow and Mumpimpan in the Shikova above Red Dam, but quite far, like 500 meters, closer to parallel side. Yeah, I walked, I walked there this afternoon. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, bye everyone. Sorry about that. It's just a major traffic jam around here this evening. But we... Hi, Mohammed. Mohammed's wondering what are the meanings of the names of the two leopards, Shongile and Hosanna. Shongile means exquisitely beautiful, and Hosanna means little prince or little chief. So that's the name, their names, and that's what they mean. And they were named by Taxon and Aubrey of Juma. So everyone's getting quite worried about Karula. I'm not too worried yet. I just think she's off looking for some loving. And there's always the possibility that she's moved into that sort of vacuum that's been left by uh, Shiluva uh, after she was killed by Tingana. Now look at that. Another tough day in the office for all of us here at Safari Live. And an exquisite sunset. You can see uh, some of the lights of the towns on the edge of the Drakensberg. Is that Marip's Corp we're looking at, Vim? Is, th is that Marip's Corp? It must be. Yes, we're trying to just have a look if that's the tower where we get uh, a send the feed out through. There's Marip's Corp. Oh, there we go. There's our tower. So our tower is the tall one, and our antenna sits about three quarters of the way up there. Now. I've actually been up to the top there. It's very beautiful. Very good bird watching up there. Cloud cisticulars, black fronted uh, uh, little push strikes. But uh, it seems like James also has a spectacular view to share with you. Well, it's spectacular ish, I think. Now, of course, I've tried to recreate that on a photograph, but old Martin is doing a far better job than I. Other than the unfortunateness that is that beastly power line, those crepuscular rays are just quite astounding, aren't they? And obviously they've sunk behind, the, the sun has sunk behind the various peaks of the Drakensberg, or some clouds, and that in turn has filtered the light out in these quite amazing rays. Now, many of you, of course, might be looking at that thinking that those rays are not, in fact, parallel to each other, which would be the case if it weren't to be the fact that the sun was so very far away. But they are parallel. And although they don't look parallel, in, uh, it's the parallel with each other because of the distance the sun is from whatever it is that's filtering the light into those rays. I believe some members of the, you know, sort of, I'm going to say, crackpot society, such as the Flat Earth Society, and those that believe that there is some great conspiracy that the sun is much closer to us than it would seem to be, and that actually it is the sun that is rotating around us. Well, one of their arguments is that, of course, well, when you look at... Uh, 
crepuscular ray like that, you can see that the rays are not parallel with each other, and the only way they could that could be the case would be if the light was very close to whatever was filtering it. Well, uh, if you ever read that or hear that conspiracy theory, now you can say, no, but I've heard and I know that's absolute nonsense. Right, there seems to be a vehicle behind us driven by a man with a very bushy moustache. Let us... <laughs> Let us continue. I too was rather like Brent, was hoping for some sign of the royal family. Haven't seen any of them for some time now. Was Karula seen in the last week at all? I think she was, wasn't she? I hope so. If not, that will me have been a rather long time without having seen her. It's a gorgeous evening. And of course, thankfully, we have infrared lights because Wendy's headlights are, well, not very impressive, really. I suppose I should get the spotlight out now. As you all know, I'm really good with the spotlight. Oh. That's not good. Hang on a second. Were it not for the man with his bushy moustache, I'd stop. Oh. That's most unfortunate. I think our the globe has blown. It's really not very good. Hmm. Oh well. We'll continue with the aid of the other lights. We do, of course, have infrared as well. All right, Brent seems to have a working spotlight. I'll see if I can fix this one. In the meantime, go and enjoy the lighthouse that is Brent Leo Smith. Well, what has James done? He's got back. I'm sure that spotlight was working yesterday, but I do have a working spotlight we also have set up our infrared rig so which means we're gonna have a gander at the hyena den to see if ribbon and her two little monsters are out and about it is definitely one of my favorite times of the year as we move from summer to winter and I'm watching all the the trees carefully for the ones that are about to change. So what Steph is wondering are Hosanna and Shungile independent now? Uh, they could be. Uh, it's it's difficult to say. Kruda has been gone for th three weeks that we know of, and uh, they might be independent already. They might not, and unfortunately, we're only going to be able to answer that for sure in the next little while. So, in the next month or so. So, it's unusual for young males to go independent at that age, but uh, not for young females. So, uh, we'll have to wait and see. Is the, is the answer? And if I had to try. Uh, say anything else I would be guessing and we don't do that it is a magnificent evening now hopefully those lions might pop out on the dam cam so please keep a look out for me that would be quite wonderful We might find a bush baby or a chameleon on our way to the hyena den. And quite a it's actually a, a really nice temperature at the moment. It's not too hot, not too cold. And of course, the cooler weather is coming.
<laughs> well, uh, <laughs> let's go across to James with an oddly coloured animal. Oddly coloured animal? I'm not sure quite how oddly coloured it is. Oh, it's a green hippopotamus, I see, yes. Well, that is, of course, because Martin has uh, engaged the infrared lighting, which in turn, I was hoping, would inspire this hippo to get out of the water. And I think he was actually going to... He was in the process of doing that when we came along. And unfortunately, seems to be a little bit nervous. And the hippopotamus in this waterhole, the young bull that is here... I must confess, I don't think is the bravest hippopotamus in the world. He's not, um, he's not one to leap out of the water in front of vehicles and display a great deal of athleticism and excitement. And so we'll just give him one minute and see if he doesn't get out of the water. But I suspect that with us here, he's just not going to do that. Alas and a lack. Oh, and the smell of the... i tell you what, I don't know what it is. I guess it's the drying grass. I guess it's the fact that the grass is getting drier that's making it smell so very delicious. There's a really lovely smell about the drive. Come on, why don't you get out? That hippo, of course, can see nothing of us, other than our outline. It's not able to see the light that is shining on it, the little green or little red light. And in the background, the white whistling duck. Come on, out you get. Be brave and strong. Take a chance. Throw caution to the wind. Just not going to happen, is it? All right, let's continue. And you're all calling him the Emerald Hippo. Well, I think that's quite an honor for him, to be honest. All right, Martin, let us go back to normal light. There we are. You can see I got the spotlight working, which is good news. Hello, Alexander, all the way from Scandinavia. Which part of Scandinavia do you come from? Is it the same part as Rebecca's ancestors come from? That is Denmark. Is it the same? Is it the inexplicably languaged Finland? Or is it perhaps Sweden or Norway? Alexander, you want to know what the scariest part of my trip to India was? Well, the scariest part of my trip to India was trying not to get Delhi Belly. Now many of you of course will know that Delhi Belly is a condition caused by unfamiliar bacteria. So if ever you go to a place that is uh, unfamiliar to your stomach, it doesn't matter whether it's in Africa or Asia or America, uh, and as soon as you drink the water in those areas, well, you can cause yourself some sort of um, distress. And that distress is uh, felt well, in the digestive tract. And unfortunately, neither Graham, Emily, or I managed to escape that particular thing. And that was the most fearful thing we saw. But Alexander, in the natural world, oh, oh the, the second thing to be afraid of when traveling in India is the driving. It is my considered opinion that the people of India have the strangest and that's kind way of saying uh, most interesting driving style in the world. Um, they, how would I describe it? Let's, let's take Johannesburg as a sort of opposite. Now, in Johannesburg, people are extremely aggressive on the roads. They drive very fast, very aggressively, probably a bit like in New York City. And if they drove, if people had the same attitudes as they do in New York City and Johannesburg, they would almost certainly die instantly on the Indian roads. In India, uh, people weave in between lanes, sort of, if you're driving along and somebody wants to turn, well, then they'll just turn straight across you. But somehow, 
very few people manage to hit each other and it is a miracle of uh, the human spirit because people there are so unaggressive they're just so completely relaxed about what they do uh, on the roads and so that was quite terrifying for Graham and I because often we thought we were definitely going to have a head-on collision but in the natural world I think there was very little to be afraid of at all they don't do a huge amount in the way of walking safaris in fact they're very unusual in many parts of India and so we didn't get to do that and most people said look we wouldn't walk here because well it's a bit nerve-wracking and I think it's just simply because uh, much like if you said to the average Kruger guide would you walk here they'd say no well, we don't walk we just do the drives because you, it's a national park so you can do some walking safaris but it's unusual there and I think that seems to be because people are... There have been some bad experiences with the, with the one-horned rhino and with the elephants on foot. But I've got to tell you, the elephant and rhino sightings that we had there, there was no sense of threat from the animals at all. And indeed, they, I know that Indian elephants can become quite nasty if you threaten them, as most animals can. I didn't get the same sense of... Yes, they were magnificent, but I didn't get the same sense of kind of stay there and watch and watch yourself like you often do with the elephants here. Now, we only had two or three elephant sightings, so I'm sure that's not always the case. And what else? The, ti the tigers, of course, that we did see, we were very lucky to see, were relatively far away. And so I didn't manage to get any sort of sense of threat from them but a tremendous tremendous experience wonderful wonderful country okay let's head across to Brent who has got a silhouette of not an Asian but an African elephant we had a silhouette uh, the heli moved on as they tend to do uh, it looks like a nice young bull probably around 30 or 25 to 30 years old but he's on a mission so I think we're gonna see where he's missioning to but in infrared. There we go. So he should be able to just make his bottom out in front of us. Uh, he is on a serious mission. We parked, he just walked straight past us. Where are you off to, mister? There is a bit of water left in Philemon's dip. Maybe he's going for a little mud bath. He looks like he's had one a bit earlier today. But he does seem to have that sort of high speed water walk on. Now you can see the dust which is actually obscuring the camera at the moment that he's causing as he walks. As he sort of jogged down the hill. Isn't this cool? Now I can just make him out in the road ahead of me, but I'm watching my monitor. And it looks like he's. Yes, go that way. That's where the mud is. Go play in the mud, please. Maybe he's found a nice bit of grass to munch on. You just hear him breaking that grass. Off he continues. And we're going to stick with him. I'm just going to give him a little bit of time to get around this corner. I don't want to sort of surprise right behind him. So of course, ah, uh, there he is. I can just sort of make him out. Yes, there. Oops, sorry, that's my bad driving. Not VM's camera work. 
And so he's probably hunting for a herd at the moment. Oh, that's a little bit of a wheel spin there. It's just changed into low range. This is this infrared capability is so cool. Hi, Reese. Reese would like to know in the future will hybrid electric vehicles be used on Safari? I think it's a strong possibility when the technology catches up. Now, as good as electric vehicles are, it's a bit difficult uh, for them to do some of the off-roading and stuff we do where you need a little bit more power. So, oh, we we're hoping he's going to go against that wonderful last light of the sky again. He might stop and feed on that marula. So what he did a bit earlier. Uh, no, he's not going for the marula. He's going to the hyena den. We were just there, mister. There are no hyenas there, don't worry. Okay, we're going to let him disappear off into the bush, become the grey ghost. <laughs> turn on our lights again. Now, James just snuck past us as well. I'm trying to think. Voldy, when was the last time we tormented James? It's been a while, hasn't it? Yep. I think maybe this week. Time to play a trick on James again. Oh, what a magnificent evening. I know the smells are just incredible at this time of the year. I can smell where that elephant's just passed. It is definitely one of the most synonymous smells of Africa. Uh, the smell of elephant and then that massive herd of buffalo and the dust. Now, I think to play a trick on James, it's going to take a bit more planning. He's becoming more wily these days. So I don't think it's going to be today, but I think sometime this week, hmm. I think definitely I'm going to use Veeam as my co-conspirator. Veeam is very good when it comes to those type of things. So now while we scheme about what nefarious act we're going to take on James Hendry with, uh, we're going to say goodbye. It's been wonderful. Unfortunately, the leopards were not on our side, uh, but we know where Shungile and Hosanna are now. Uh, hopefully they'll be back in the morning and hopefully the magical Queen Karula makes an appearance as well. So again, from Vim and myself, bye, see you in the morning. Yes, the leopards have not been on our side. There was a lovely sighting actually. I sort of half shared with you there as we snuck past Brent. Gorgeous to see that elephant silhouetted against the late sky. Well, we have about two minutes left to find a cat of some sort. And so I will just say to you, our species list in India, for those of you interested in the big game, lots of birds that we saw, probably about 60 species or so. And then we saw five tigers, many one-horned rhinoceri, and two or three herds of elephants, lots and lots of water buffalo, something called a spotted deer, gorgeous creature about the size of an impala. Uh, oh, lion. We didn't see a lion in India. That's a lion there. Right, let's go infrared. Lights down. This lion is hunting. Are we infrareded? There we go. Well done. Perfect. Good job. Are we infrared? There we are. Well done. Okay, I now can't see anything, so I'm going to have to follow you, Martin. I better just call this in. Um, right, quickly call this in. 
Stations 1 Lioness on quarantine clearings, mobile in a northerly direction. Animals are definitely hunting. This is going to be worth watching, I think, for a little while. She's on the hunt, almost certainly. We know the wildebeest herd was here. I did hear the impala alarming, but they've stopped now. And I wonder if there isn't an ambush afoot. I'm going to ask Rebecca to tell Brent to go around the eastern side of quarantine. We're on the western side. And just see if he can't pick up something that side, maybe. Can you still see the lion? Well spotted. Something's calling a bird. Okay. You gotta. I can't even see where you're looking. Okay, now I can see. Just behind this bush. Just keep going. So I'm now navigating by means of the, there you go, by means of the same picture that you're seeing. So we're pretty much parallel with her, right? Go ahead. Ooh. They've been spotted, I'm afraid. Let me just call that in. The yeah, stations, these animals have definitely been spotted in part of our alarm calling. Animal is now coming onto quarantine clearings, going north at the junction with that fireside chat road. Yeah, you can hear the impala going. Amazing that because I can't see that line with my naked eye. You and I would not be able to do it But clearly the Impala have got far better eyes than us unless there's another line is that side Let's keep going Brent says they're wildebeest on the eastern side where he is She not on the road there Just look on the road in front of us Ooh, we've lost her. Oh, yeah, she sneezed. Look, look, look over there. Anything there? There yeah. she is. Thankfully, she's got a bit of a cold. She's running now. Now, I cannot see her but for the same picture that you're getting. Ooh, where are we going? Okay, I'm going to turn up onto here. Can you still see her? No. There she is. Got her. Well done. Now, Station's Animal is now northern side of the clearings. Um, still mobile north by northeast. Only one station here at the moment. I mean, you'll see her. I might have to flick some lights on quickly. Oh, no, you got her. You can see eyes blinking. And there's a car. Okay, I'm going to have to turn the lights on to have a look. There she goes. Okay, she's now turned south. Right, now this is the difficulty, of course, is that I cannot see what's going on in front of me. Luckily we're on the clearings. 
Stations is Linus is now mobile south. She's turned round. Can you still see her at all there, Martin? Yes, there's going to be lots of shaking. Go left a bit. Uh, okay, copy. Yeah, I think that's where she's heading, Brent. Brent says he's got the wildebeest in front of her. Him. Let's just quickly keep this going. I know we're now well over time, but we're just going to keep it going. The spotlight is clearly about to give up. The, there she is. She's just to the right there. I'm now heading straight towards her. You got her there. Well done. Oh gosh, didn't see that stick. Alright chaps, I think we're going to have to call this week. Oh, there she is. No, that's a wildebeest. Okay, let's just be quiet and let's wait here. Because this lioness is quite close to this wildebeest. Has the lioness gone? She must be right here, somewhere. Still in parlour, alarm calling behind us. Might be worth just waiting here to see if she doesn't come launching out of the bushes. So that's dead straight in front of us. Just look to the left behind this wildebeest. Yeah, behind that bush. Nothing there. I'll go back to the wilde and maybe just scan to the right as well. Now they're in parlour alarm calling the other side. Now I think that he has heard the lioness. He's not far in front of us now, actually, you can see him quite easily. I'll give this one minute and then we'll move around to the other side. Yes, I know, isn't it confusing? Right now he's using his ears and his nose more than he's using anything else. And Impala alarm calling off towards Inga's house. Yeah, and that's what Brent reckons is the other lioness. Okay, copy that. Let's move slightly. I'm going to leave the Vildi where he is and just move to where he's been looking now, of course this is all very good practice for any kind of night hunting that we want to film it's not easy and would be substantially easier with a thermal camera of course which hopefully we will have at some stage there what's that is that an impala Yes, it's an Impala, looking at the wildebeest. See if you can find the wildebeest again. Should be just off to the left. There's Leo Smith. That's his infrared light. There's the wildebeest, sorry. Like that hit a small hole. Turn left, 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 go left, go left. There go the wildebeest, the lions are going to chase, the lions will be chasing. Huge herd of wildebeest running. Keep the camera up. 
Oh, we're in amongst the dust. Wonderful stuff. Where are the lions now? Of course, once they've given chase, we can probably turn the lights on. We'll be okay. Let's go in from behind. Well, they gave chase. I'm not sure that they're going to have succeeded there, though. There she is. I'm afraid they made a mess of that one. Wonderful. That is great. All right, everyone. I think we're going to pack this up. I'm afraid you're leaning on your radio again, Martin. Um, we're going to pack this in. We obviously don't know how much effect we're having and how much we aren't. But thank you very much for joining us on our little show today, our wonderful drive, which ended up pretty action-packed. We'll see what these lionesses do and keep you informed about it in the morning. Until then, well, I hope that you stay very Oh, this is the longest 30 seconds of my life. Uh, we're going to just see if we can't maybe stick with them for a bit longer and we'll see what they do. So thanks for coming. A big thanks to the final control and to Brent and Jamie. We will see you all tomorrow as Brent disappears into the distance there at 0600.